Yo, what's up? Welcome back to another episode of The Source. We ended up having a winning Tuesday night. It started off bad with the Magic. I lost the Magic plus two and a half, Magic money line, and the under. So three losses in that game. But then the Nets came back from the dead to cover plus nine. And then the Suns squeaked out a cover. So I ended up making a few dollars. I mean, it was pretty much a break-even night, but it was in the green. Gotta love it, man. This 2024 has been really kind to me. Hopefully that continues. That being said, we're moving on to Wednesday. Probably the most loaded NBA slate of the year. Not so much in the value department, but as far as the number of games on the board, there's 13 of them. So let's get it started. Welcome to the source. The source. Source. Get the source. First up, Miami on the road in Philly. Sixers are laying three points here, and the total sitting at 224 and a half. Let's take a quick look at the spreadsheet, and according to the model, the Heat should win this one outright. Final score, 114-112 Miami. Inactives on the Miami side. Jimmy Butler is still out. Uh, Josh Richardson's still out, and Terry Rozier is still out. So the Heat's still missing those same three pieces. Things aren't looking great on the Philadelphia side either. Batum is still out. Covington's still out. Obviously, Embiid's going to be out for a while. Tobias Harris has been ruled out for this game, and the Anthony Melton is still out as well. So obviously, Miami just played a game last night against the Bucks, a big win. Uh, so why don't we start out by taking a look at their numbers on zero days rest this season? Offensively, 29th in efficiency, uh, just two, four, and one against the spread in their seven games on zero days rest this year. Some more betting trends on the Miami side. The Heat have been covering the number six and one against the spread in their last seven now, uh, just four and six against the spread in their last 10 on the road, though. On the Philadelphia side, as we know, the Sixers have been struggling recently, just four and eight against the spread in their last 12 overall. 0-5 against the spread in their last five at home. In this particular head-to-head -head matchup, it's been all Miami. The Heat are 5-1 against the spread in their last six matchups against the Sixers. They're also 3-0 against the spread in their last three trips to Philly. The under has been cashing in Miami Heat games. Uh, the under is 14-3 in the last 17 Heat games, 10-1 in their last 11 on the road. All right, so let's match these two teams up on the court. Uh, we got a Sixers team coming in hot off a rare W, uh, rare nowadays, I should say, 123-121 uh, over Cleveland. I had Cavs team total over 120 and a half in that game, cashed it on a late Donovan Mitchell free throw, loved it, was clutch, came down to the wire. Uh, so how do they match up here against Miami? Not off to a great start. As we know, Philly's been taking a lot of shots on the interior in the last five. Uh, without Embiid, they've been attacking the basket a lot. Fifth in shot frequency at the rim. Uh, 24th in efficiency, so they haven't really been hitting them. And look at Miami's defense protecting the rim here. Uh, great looking numbers at the basket. But if we move a few feet back to those short mid-range shots, Miami's got terrible defensive numbers. Not that the Sixers are setting the world on fire, just 24th in efficiency, but they are taking a decent amount of them. We can't expect much out of Philly in terms of the fast break. Uh, Miami's been locked down defensively in transition all season. We know the Sixers like to run a faster pace when Embiid's not in the lineup. I don't know if that works out for them here on paper. Now, I will say Miami in a back-to-back, -back, maybe they're not quite up to the task of, of slowing down the Philly fast break, but on paper, that should be a tough matchup. Now, on the other side of the court, as we know, the Philadelphia defense has been really struggling recently. That being said, I do have a positive angle for the Sixers defense here. They've been falling apart everywhere except one shot zone. They've defended those short mid-range shots pretty well. 11th in frequency, 5th in efficiency in the last five games. As we know, the Heat love shooting from that zone. 29% of the Miami Heat shot attempts have come from the short mid-range uh, from the short mid-range zone in the last five. The main weakness of this Sixers defense recently has been the three-point shot. They've been absolutely terrible against the three ball, but the Miami Heat have not been hitting from outside. 20th and 29th in efficiency from the corner and above the break three in the last 10. As far as betting this game, I mean, I hate the idea of laying points with this Sixers team right now. Uh, but that's the only way I'd lean here, uh, especially with those terrible Miami Heat back-to-back uh, -back numbers. But with all the injuries to Philly, it'll probably keep me off this one. I'd love to try to jump on that Miami Heat under train, but on the back-to-back -back with Philly pushing the tempo up and down the court, I don't really want to do that either. So I'll say Philly minus three or pass next game. New York Knicks on the road at Orlando. Magic Lane two and a half points at home. The total's down at 214 for this one. Let's take a quick look at the spreadsheet. And according to the model, we should see a four point Orlando win. Final score 113 109 Magic. Injuries on the New York side, and we got a bunch here. Obviously, Julius Randle's still out. He should be out another week or two. Uh, OG Ananobi is still out. Hartenstein is questionable. DiVincenzo's questionable. Mitchell Robinson's still out. 
Uh, Knicks are definitely in some in pretty bad shape here injury wise. On the Orlando side, uh, they haven't released an injury report yet. They just finished the game against the Thunder a few hours ago. So we'll wait and see. Orlando has been very healthy though. They've been pretty much putting out blank injury reports for a couple weeks now. So we'll wait and see. So obviously Orlando's on a back-to-back. -back. They just played Oklahoma City last night. And unfortunately, I bet the Magic. <laughs> uh, Thunder beat them up pretty good. Magic on zero days rest this season, just two and eight straight up, but they are five and five against the spread. So they've mostly been underdogs in these spots. Now they're laying points, so it's a bit of a different situation. Knicks are coming off a heartbreaking loss to Houston. Final score was 105-103. They're actually protesting the game. They're protesting the loss because of the, the bad call at the end. It's only the eighth time, I think, in NBA history a team has protested a loss. <laughs> we'll see how that works out. Welcome to Knicks basketball. Betting trends on the New York side. Uh, Knicks are 0-5 against the spread in their last five, so five straight losses against the spread for the Knicks. Uh, they are 5-2 and two against the spread in their last seven on the road, though. 3-6 and six against the spread in their last nine as road underdogs. On the Orlando side, the trends are looking pretty nice. Uh, Magic, 7-2 and two against the spread in their last nine overall, 4-2 and two against the spread in their last six at home, 9-3 and three against the spread in their last 12 as home favorites. Oh, that's as home favorites on the whole season. In this particular matchup, Orlando's gotten the better of New York. As a Knicks fan, we always seem to struggle with this Magic team. Uh, Magic, 7-4 and four against the spread in their last 11 matchups against the Knicks. Uh, they're also 7-4 and four against the spread in their last 11 home games against the Knicks. The under has been cashing in New York Knicks games. Uh, the under is 18-4 and four in the last 22 Knicks games. Uh, it's also 6-1 and one in the last seven road games. And this particular head-to-head -head matchup has been all unders. Between the Knicks and Magic, seven straight unders, 6-1 uh, and one to the under in the last seven games in Orlando. So let's match these two teams up on the court. And right off the bat, we got a positive angle for New York. Uh, Knicks offense, as we know, attacking the interior a lot. In the last 10 games, they're 10th in rim frequency, third in paint frequency. So 56% of the New York Knicks shot attempts have come from 12 feet and in in the last 10 games. These have been two main areas of weakness for Orlando's defense. Look at the defensive efficiency numbers here. 28th at the rim, 29th in the paint. This Magic defense is starting to have some problems. I mean, we just saw it last night. Oklahoma City put up 127 points. They shot 54.8% from the floor. Now, the Knicks offense is certainly not Oklahoma City's offense, especially with the injuries, but still, these defense is struggling right now. It's actually a favorable matchup for the Knicks offense. One thing Orlando does do a good job of offensively is get to the free throw line. Uh, now, if you look at the full season numbers, I'd say that's a positive angle for the Knicks. So they don't foul much, but with Ananobi out, with Randall out, Hartenstein's been on and off the court. Look at the numbers from the last five games. The Knicks are 29th in defensive free throw rate. They are still rebounding the ball well, which is huge against an Orlando team that's usually pretty active on the offensive glass. Now for the bad news for Orlando offensively. Uh, they're looking at the same sort of bad matchup that they had last night against OKC. Oklahoma City protects the basket really well. Orlando loves to attack the basket. Same story here for the Knicks. When Hartenstein's on the court, Knicks still have an elite interior defense. It's the three-point defense that's fallen off for the Knicks with Ananobi out. Uh, but Orlando doesn't have much outside shooting to take advantage of that. So if Hardenstein plays, I actually like this matchup a lot for the Knicks defense. As far as placing a bet in this game, though, I don't know. I mean... It's a favorable matchup for the Knicks, in my opinion. You got Orlando on a back-to-back, -back, so okay, I want to get to the Knicks. But with DiVincenzo and Hartenstein both questionable, and the fact that Orlando always seems to give the Knicks problems, I honestly have no idea. I, I, under a pass, I guess. Next. Atlanta on the road in Charlotte. Hornets catching six and a half points at home. The total sitting at 237 and a half. Let's take a quick look at the spreadsheet. And according to the model, we should see a five point Hawks win. Final score 122, 117 Atlanta. Inactives on the Atlanta side. Clint Capella is still out. Uh, Kongwu is going to miss this one. So Atlanta missing both of their bigs here. Uh, Wesley Matthews is still out as well. On the Hornets side, LaMelo Ball is still out. Mark Williams is still out as well. Other than that, they should be good to go, though. Cody Martin is on the injury report, but he's listed as probable. Betting trends on the Hawks side, 6-2 and two against the spread in the last eight. Okay, Hawks. 3-2 and two against the spread in their last five on the road. Just 3-6 and six against the spread as road favorites this year. Look at these trends for the Charlotte Hornets. Charlotte is 4-1 against the spread in their last five overall. 4-0 against the spread in their last four games at home. In this particular head-to-head -head matchup, it's been all Charlotte. 
Hawks are just one and four against the spread in their last five matchups against the Hornets, five, 10 and one against the spread in their last 16 trips to Charlotte. Trends are pointing to the under in these Atlanta games. Uh, the under is eight and three in the last 11 Hawks games, four and two in their last six on the road, but it's actually pointing towards the over on the Hornets side, seven and four to the over in their last 11 and six and three to the over in their last nine at home. So let's match these two teams up on the court. And we got the Hornets coming off back to back wins here. Uh, beat the Pacers on Monday, beat the Grizzlies on Saturday. Look at these Hornets go. Uh, so can they make it three in a row? I'm going to say absolutely not because they can't protect the basket. In the last 10 games, they're 30th in defensive efficiency at the rim, 30th in defensive efficiency in the paint. That's where Atlanta's been attacking, man. Look at their frequency numbers in those two zones. Atlanta's been attacking the interior. Look, we know that the Atlanta Hawks defense is pretty awful, but they actually defend the mid-range shot pretty well. Uh, it's the three ball that's given the Hawks problems. If you want to go ahead and place a bet on Charlotte and trust the Hornets outside shooting, be my guest. But there's no way I'm going to. Uh, I'm taking Atlanta at minus six and a half here. I mean, a few games back, the Raptors were laying seven and a half in Charlotte. The Raptors, one of the worst teams in the league right now. Now the Hawks are laying less just because Okongwu's out. I mean, this is still one of the most dangerous offenses in the NBA. They're 6-2 and two against, uh, six and two against the spread in their last eight. Uh, Hawks should be laying double digits here, or at least nine. So, yeah, I think I'm getting a good price here. Atlanta minus 6.5 next game. Brooklyn on the road in Boston. Celtics laying 12.5 points at home. The total sitting at 226.5. I hate these back-to-back home-and-homes. These two teams just played in Brooklyn last night. I got the Nets plus 9 cover. Kind of lucky to get it. They grabbed it at the end through the back door. As far as betting this game, I'll probably bet Brooklyn again. Uh, just because Boston can't seem to cover a number to save their lives right now. Celtics are just 1-8 and eight against the spread in their last nine. I like the matchup for the Nets, just like I did last night. And actually, historically, the Nets have been better against the number on the road in Boston than they have at home. So give me Nets plus 12 and a half. Next game. Indiana's on the road. Siakam returns to Toronto here. Raps catching three and a half points at home. Total sitting at 244. Let's take a quick look at the spreadsheet. And according to the model, Toronto should win this one outright. It's crazy. Final score, 117, 116 Raps. Injury report for Indiana. Tyrese Halliburton's listed as questionable. But I feel like he's always listed as questionable nowadays. Uh, Matherin is also listed as questionable. Jalen Smith has been ruled out for the Pacers. On the Toronto side, we got RJ Barrett listed as questionable. Uh, other than that, the Raps should be good to go. But we got to keep an eye out for RJ Barrett. Betting trends for the Pacers. Indiana. Indiana just two and five against the spread in their last seven. Pacers have not been covering the number. Three and four against the spread in their last seven on the road. Five and three against the spread on the season as road favorites. Uh, on the Toronto side, they're just five and 11 against the spread in their last 16. Three and eight against the spread in their last 11 at home. One and five against the spread in their last six as home dogs. Ugly looking trends for both teams there. Unders have been almost automatic for the Pacers. The under is four and one in the last five Indiana games. And check this out. 15 and 2 in the last 17 Pacers road games. So Pacers on the road, those unders have been cashing. I just took one. I took the under in the Pacers Hornets game the other night. Unders have also been cashing in Toronto games as well. Three straight unders for the Raps, eight straight unders for the Raps at home. So trends point heavily towards an under here. So let's match these two teams up on the court. And right off the bat, I know a huge mismatch without even looking at it. Pacers attack the rim. Raptors are beginning cooked at the basket. On the last 10 games, the Pacers are second in shot frequency at the rim. Look at the Toronto defensive numbers down there. 26th in frequency, 29th in efficiency. Pacers offense also likes to push the tempo. Uh, they're third in fast break frequency, 13th in efficiency on the season. Now, the Raptors have been good about limiting transition opportunities. They're fifth in frequency. Look at the efficiency all the way back at 28th. The only positive angle for Toronto defensively here would be free throw rate. Indiana having trouble getting to the foul line, just 28th in the last 10. Toronto defense is actually ninth in defensive frequency free throw rate in the last 10. On the other side of the court, we got the Raps offense and let's give them some credit. They're starting to get active on the offensive glass again. Now that Pirtle's back from injury, they were really struggling there for a while, but in the last 10 games, they're up to 11th in offensive rebounding rate. Pacers have not been a good defensive rebounding team back at 27th. But after that, I think the matchup points to the Pacers defense here. Uh, Toronto struggling to protect the basketball, 21st in turnover rate. Indiana defensively in the last 10 is sixth. Uh, Raptors also rely heavily on attacking the rim. They're seventh in frequency in the last 10. Uh, Pacers allow a lot of shots at the rim, but that's what their defense does. They funnel you in to try to take, get you to take contested layups. In the last 10 games, they're fifth in defensive efficiency protecting the basket. So that's a positive angle for the Pacers as well. As far as betting this game, I know laying points with this Pacers team on the road right now seems crazy. But this is a super short line, and I just think there's a huge gap between these two teams. Uh, this seems like a nice little get-right spot for the Pacers. This is definitely super square. I would imagine the public's going to come in heavy on Indiana. 
I don't care. I'm on the Pacers minus three and a half. I'm also going to look at the under here at 244 just because those trends are crazy next game. Chicago Bulls on the road in Cleveland. Uh, Cavs are laying nine points at home and the total sitting at 220 and a half. Let's take a quick look at the spreadsheet. And according to the model, we should see a six point Cavs win. Final score 116, 110 Cleveland. Injury report on the Chicago side. Uh, Caruso is listed as questionable. He just sat out in their last game. Other than that, you got Torrey Craig probable. Patrick Williams is still out. On the Cleveland side, Tristan Thompson's still out. I don't even have him on this graphic. Dean Wade is listed as questionable. Other than that, Cavs should be good to go. Betting trends on the Chicago side. Uh, Bulls are 8-4 and four against the spread in their last 12. Bulls have been covering the number. 6-2 and two against the spread in their last 8 on the road. Just 2-5 and five against the spread in their last 7 as road dogs, though. Uh, on the Cleveland side, they're four and four against the spread in their last eight, seven and three against the spread in their last 10 at home. In this particular head-to-head -head matchup, it's been all Cavs. Uh, Cleveland's five and one against the spread in their last six matchups against the Bulls, five and one against the spread in their last six home games against the Bulls. Conflicting trends here as far as the totals. Uh, so we've seen six straight overs in Chicago Bulls games, five and one to the over in their last six on the road. But in this particular head-to-head -head matchup, it's been 10 and four to the under in their last 14, four and one to the under in the last five matchups in Cleveland so let's match these two teams up on the court uh, as we know we're looking at Chicago Bulls game so we got to look at the mid-range shot third and long mid-range frequency ninth and efficiency in the last 10 games for the Bulls offense it's actually been an area a weaker area defensively for Cleveland 22nd in frequency 15th and efficiency in the last 10 here's the thing though Cleveland may have some weaker defensive numbers against a long mid-range shot but they actually have great defensive numbers against a short mid-range shot another area where the Bulls take a lot of uh, a lot of shots from their 12th and frequency first and efficiency in the last 10. As far as the matchup for the Cavs offense, obviously we need to look at three-point shooting. They take a ton of them. Fourth and above the break frequency, 10th and corner frequency in the last 10. Chicago's been getting smoked from three. This is bad news for the Bulls. In the last 10 games, they're 28th in frequency, 24th in efficiency from, the, from above the break, and their numbers against the corner three aren't much better, 23rd and 22nd. So that's a positive angle for Cleveland, but you know who else has an absolutely terrible defense against a three-point shot right now? Philadelphia and Cleveland didn't exactly exploit it just 13 of 37 from three the other night against the Sixers I mean that's not terrible but we just got done talking about how the Bulls are going to struggle to score right because the Cavs defensive numbers against that short mid-range shot are so elite can't score on the Cavs on the interior well you know what the Sixers just hung 123 points shot over 54 percent from the floor over 42 percent from three 58 points in the paint this Bulls offense has been good recently in the last five games they're seventh in overall offensive efficiency if the Sixers Sixers can go off on Cleveland the Bulls definitely can which is why I'm on Chicago here I think this Cleveland team is extremely overvalued right now they went on a heater and right now they're getting priced as the one or two seed in the Eastern Conference we know that's not where they're gonna be we know that's not what this Cleveland team is they're a four or five seed uh this number's way too big give me Chicago plus nine next game Washington on the road in New Orleans uh Pelly's laying 12 and a half points at home the total sitting at 236 and a half let's take a quick look at the spreadsheet and according to the model we should see a 14 point New Orleans win final score 121 107 Pelly's injuries on the Washington side uh we got nothing as far as the main pieces for the Wizards everyone should be good to go according to this injury report on the New Orleans side we got Zion Williamson listed as questionable Cody Zeller listed as questionable Dyson Daniels has been ruled out for this game betting trends on the washington side uh wizards 17 9 and 1 against the spread on the road now second most profitable road team in the nba it's crazy um they're three and one against the spread in their last four six and oh against the spread in their last six on the road but you know what trends look pretty good on the new orleans side also five and three against the spread in their last eight five and three against the spread in their last eight at home five and one against the spread in their last six as home favorites uh, and as far as this particular matchup goes it's pretty much been all pelicans wizards are just three and six against the spread in their last nine against new orleans one and four against the spread in their last five trips to new orleans both of these teams have been trending towards unders uh washington two and ten to the under in their last 12 overall uh two and nine to the under in their last 11 on the road new orleans two and six to the under in their last eight so trends pointing to an under heavy here so let's match these two teams up on the court and we'll start with washington's offense and uh <laughs> Not, not many positive angles here for the Wizards. Uh, look at the main four factors here. Rebounding goes to the Pelicans. Turnovers, Pelicans. Free throw rate, Pelicans. If we pull up some shot zones, we know the Wizards love to attack the interior. They take a lot of shots from the paint, a lot of shots at the rim. Pelicans have been strong as hell guarding that short little mid-range shot. Third in frequency and third in efficiency in the last 10 games. This isn't looking good for Washington. Now, what about the other side of the court? What about the Pelicans offense against the Wizards defense? 
Uh, shocker, more positive angles for the Pellies here. Uh, Pelicans love shooting that long mid-range shot. Fifth in frequency, sixth in efficiency in the last 10. Uh, during that same span, the Wizards defense is 25th and 21st against that shot. Uh, Pelicans have also been more aggressive attacking the rim recently. They're ninth in rim frequency in the last five games. Washington's been getting cooked down there all season. That's been the main weakness of the Wizards defense from October. Uh, in the last five games, they're 20th in frequency, 27th in efficiency. So that's actually a step up. <laughs> 27th in defensive efficiency at the rim. That's actually a step up in the last five for Washington. As far as betting this game, if you subscribe to this channel, you know I love betting the Wizards on the road. I've done it a lot. Uh, that being said, this might actually be the perfect storm of a nightmare matchup for Washington on paper. I mean, on paper, the Pelly should win this game by 30 points. <laughs> uh, so that's the only way I'd lean here. I'm not going to lay the points to the Wizards. Maybe a Pelicans first half. They've been a really good first half team this year. So I'd probably look at a Pelicans first half bet here. Next game. Houston on the road in Memphis. Grizzlies catching four points at home. The total sitting at 218. Let's take a quick look at the spreadsheet. And according to the model, we should see a five-point Rockets win. Final score, 113-108 Houston. Injury report on the Houston side. Uh, Tari Eason is still out. Fred Van Vliet is still out. He won't be returning until after the All-Star break. Well, obviously, it's their last game before the All-Star break. Uh, Cam Whitmore has also been ruled out. On the Memphis side, obviously, they're banged up, but actually not quite as bad. I mean, uh, Vince Williams is healthy. Conchar is healthy. Aldama is healthy. Jaron Jackson Jr. is healthy. They're still crushed. I mean, Desmond Bain, Brandon Clark, LaRavia, obviously, John Morant, Scotty Pippen, Marcus Smart. I mean, they're still crushed with injuries, but... As far as what we've seen over the last couple of months, they're actually not in bad shape for this one. Betting trends on the Houston side. Uh, Rockets, six and four against the spread in their last 10. Three and nine against the spread in their last 12 on the road. Two and one against the spread as road favorites, though. So it's really as road dogs where the Rockets have a terrible record. They actually have a winning record as road favorites this year. On the Memphis side, uh, two and four against the spread in their last six. We know the Grizzlies have them. It probably should be one and five, too, because they were crazy to get that cover against the Pelicans the other night. Uh, five and two against the spread in their last seven at home, though. In this particular matchup, Houston's definitely gotten the better of Memphis. Uh, the Rockets are six, three, and one against the spread in their last 10 against the Grizzlies. Seven and four against the spread in their last 11 trips to Memphis as well. Uh, Rockets games have been trending towards the under. Four and one to the under in their last five. Four and one to the under in their last five on the road. Uh, Grizzlies games have also been trending towards the under 11 and three to the under in their last 14 home games. So let's match these two teams up on the court. Uh, Rockets offense definitely has the edge in the rebounding department. Seventh in offensive rebounding rate in the last 10. Memphis defense back at 19th. Houston's also been living at the rim recently. In the last 10 games, they're first in shot frequency at the rim. All of a sudden, that's a weakness for Memphis defensively. I mean, the first three months of the year, they were doing a really good job protecting the basket. In the last 10 games, they're 24th in frequency, 22nd in efficiency. The other main shot zone for Houston offensively is the above the break three. They're 10th in frequency in the last 10 games. Memphis defense has struggled out there as well. 29th in frequency, 15th in efficiency. So overall, pretty good matchup for the Rockets. There are, however, a couple of positive angles for the Grizzlies defense here. One being turnovers. Memphis in the last 10 games, uh, third in forced turnover rate rockets back at 22nd uh, also the rockets like to run in transition their 10th and fast break frequency uh, memphis has actually been good guarding the fast break their third in defensive efficiency in transition this year when we flip things around and look at the other side uh, there's just not many nice things to say about the grizzlies offense they're really struggling uh, offensive rebounds go to Rockets heavy, 6th to 24th. Turnovers, 28th to 8th, so the Rockets should be forcing plenty of turnovers in this matchup. Really, the only area offensively where Memphis has had some success this year is shooting the three ball. Uh, they've actually had stretches where they've shot the three ball pretty well here and there. Rockets defensively on the season, 4th and 5th in defensive efficiency against the above the break and corner three-point shots. As far as betting this game, I'm definitely on Houston here. I mean, I know laying four points on the road with Houston may seem a little crazy, but there's no way... I am touching this Memphis Grizzlies team right now at only four points. The Memphis Grizzlies have lost nine games in a row. Want to know how many times in those nine games they've come within five points? Zero. <laughs> Not once. Give me Houston minus four next game. San Antonio on the road at Dallas. Mavs laying 11 and a half points at home. The total sitting at 241 and a half. Let's take a quick look at the spreadsheet. According to the model, we should see a seven point Dallas win. Final score, 119-112 Mavs. Injury report on the San Antonio side. Nothing. Spurs should be good to go here, according to this report. 
On the Dallas side, you got Luka and Kyrie both on the report, but they're both listed as probable. Maxi Kleba, questionable. Derek Lively might be back. He's been out. He's listed as questionable. Dante Exum is still out. Betting trends on the Spurs side. Uh, two and six against the spread in the last eight is pretty ugly. They are, however, seven and five against the spread in their last 12 on the road. On the Dallas side, it's almost the complete opposite. They've been covering recently. They're four and one against the spread in their last five, but just one and six against the spread in their last seven at home. And get this, 0 oh and four against the spread in their last four as home favorites and if you look at the history between this particular head-to-head -head matchup it's kind of congruent with that i mean the spurs are just one and four against the spread in their last five matchups against the mavericks but on the road in dallas they're actually four and two against the spread in their last six trips out there both of these teams trending heavily towards the under uh the under is nine and one in the last 10 spurs games three and one in the last four spurs road games the under is also nine and four in the last 13 dallas games 12 and six in the last 18 dallas home games weirdly enough though in this head-to-head -head matchup it's been all overs eight straight overs between these two teams five and one to the over in the last six matchups in dallas so i don't know not much to go by there so let's match these two teams up on the court and we'll start with the spurs offense uh they like to push the tempo their seventh and fast break frequency which is a good start because dallas defensively has struggled guarding the fast break 14th in frequency 24th in defensive efficiency after that though i really had trouble finding angles here i still don't really know what this dallas mavericks defense is uh, between all the injuries people in and out of the lineups it's just really tough to give that team an identity when we flip it over to the other side though and look at the dallas offense they definitely do have an identity they shoot the three ball we know that they take a lot of jump shots uh, and that's bad news for the Spurs because they've been struggling guarding shunt, uh, jump shooters. You can see the Dallas shot frequency numbers from the long mid-range shot above the break three and the corner three, fifth, fifth, and first. So they take a ton of them. Spurs defensive efficiency against those three zones, 25th, 27th, 15th. The only positive angle I see for the Spurs defensively here is they definitely have the rebounding advantage. Dallas not very active on the offensive glass, just 27th in the last 10 games. Spurs defensively 11th. As far as betting this game, I mean... I am not really trying to lay 11 and a half points with the Dallas Mavericks team that just never seems to cover the number at home when they're favored. Uh, but I really like this matchup for them. I mean, I think the table's set for a Dallas Maverick three-point party. Uh, this is probably a pass for me. Maybe a Dallas first half, honestly. I'll take a look at this one. And I'll let you know on the live show the final decision. But leaning towards Dallas some way. Maybe a Dallas team total over? Something like, well, it's been trending towards the under. So I'll let you know on the live show. I'm just thinking out loud right now. Next game. Lakers at Jazz is up next. And I actually didn't have time to look at this game because the Lakers just finished about an hour and a half ago. So haven't even looked at this one. I'll take a look at the morning and let you know my final decision on the live show 4 p.m eastern time ski i believe is joining us too so yeah we'll talk about that one on the live show next game sacramento on the road in denver kings are on a back-to-back -back. they're also playing right now against the suns uh this line right now is nuggets minus six total sitting at 229 and a half let's take a quick look at the spreadsheet and according to the model we should see a four point denver win Final score, 117, 113 Nuggets. Injuries on the Sacramento side. Well, like I said, they're playing, so they haven't released an injury report for this game yet. Uh, but we know Vizenkov is out. He's been, he's going to miss two or three weeks. So we know he's out. Other than that, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, on the Denver side, Caldwell Pope is questionable. Jamal Murray is actually questionable for the Nuggets. Uh, other than that, it looks like everyone's good. Betting trends on the Kings side. Obviously, these don't include the game against Phoenix that's still being played right now. I'll update it in the graphic. Uh, Kings are 16, 11, and 1 against the spread on the road this year. That's the fifth most profitable road team in the NBA. Just 1 and 3 against the spread in their last four, though. Uh, overs have been hitting. Over is 5 0 oh, 1 in the last six Kings games. On the Denver side, uh, Nuggets are just 12 12 and 1 against the spread at home this year. 16th most profitable road team in the NBA. Nuggets at home is a loss. It hasn't even turned a profit this year. Uh, Denver 1 and 4 against the spread in their last five. 1 and 4 against the spread in their last five at home. Before we get into this one, we need to mention that these two teams just played last Friday. Sacramento beat the life out of the Nuggets. Final score is 135 106 Kings in Sacramento. So I want to start off by pulling up the overall efficiency numbers in the last 10 games i don't think people realize how poorly the nuggets have been playing just 24th in overall efficiency in the last 10 24th offensively 20th defensively i mean not that the kings are setting the world on fire at 16th but if you scroll down and look at strength of schedule they're actually close Denver's fifth in the last 10 games. The Kings are eighth. And let's pull up the three-point shooting numbers for the Kings offense. We know they take a lot of them. On the last 10 games, they're third and seventh in shot frequency from the corner and above the break three. Look at Denver's defensive efficiency numbers in the last 10 games against the above the break three. 28. Nuggets opponents are shooting 39.6% from above the break in the last 10 games. That's bad. I mean, we just saw it. 
This Sacramento offense went off on Denver. They shot 58.6% from the floor, 17 of 34 from deep. I mean, based on Denver's recent defensive numbers, who's to say they don't do the same exact thing in this one? And when we flip it around and look at the numbers for Denver's offense, it honestly doesn't even get much better. Um, definitely got to give them some props in the offensive rebound. They're actually first in offensive rebounding rate in the last 10 games, but Sacramento's been a strong defensive rebounding team. They're fifth. So I don't even know if that's an edge there. Look at the efficient field goal percentage from the last 10 games for the Nuggets offense. 30th, dead last. The defending champion Nuggets, dead last. We know the weakness of this Kings defense is the three-point line. It has been all year. Look at the recent outside shooting numbers from Denver. 25th, 19th. I mean, this doesn't look good. Now, if you're looking to bet Denver in this spot, I do have a positive angle for you. Uh, it's the mid-range shooting. Denver's been taking a lot of mid-range shots. 36% of the Nuggets shot attempts have come from mid-range in the last 10. Not really hitting them at a great rate. They're 18th and 12th in efficiency, but it's something, especially since the Kings have struggled to defend the mid-range shot. I mean, basically the Kings have struggled against any shot outside of eight feet. They actually have strong numbers protecting the basket, but anything outside of that, the Kings have problems with. So you can point at the mid-range shot for Denver. That should be there. But for me, the icing on the cake is the Kings fast break numbers. Kings first in fast break frequency. No one runs the fast break more often than the Sacramento Kings this year. Look at Denver's defensive numbers in transition. 26 and 28th there's no way i could take the nuggets here i mean it sounds crazy you got the kings on a back-to-back -back in denver against the defending champions who need a win they're coming off an ugly loss obviously like you want to take the nuggets but these numbers are bad and i won't do it uh, i'm not betting the kings at six though i'm hoping that that number gets bet up if i can get kings at like eight and a half i will take it so I'm on the Kings. I'm just waiting for a better number next game. Clippers on the road in Golden State. The Warriors are now laying two and a half points. They were underdogs. Clippers were laying two. I actually grabbed the Clippers at minus one and a half, so I kind of got screwed with that Kawhi injury update. In case you haven't heard, Kawhi Leonard's been ruled out. Uh, that's why the line flipped. Total sitting at 234 and a half. Let's take a quick look at the spreadsheet, and according to the model, we should see a five-point Golden State win. Final score, 118-113 Golden State. Inactives on the Clippers' side, as I previously mentioned. Kawhi Leonard has been ruled out. Nobody else on the injury report, though, for the Clips. On the Golden State side, Warriors are pretty much at full strength as well. Chris Paul is not back yet, though. He's still ruled out. So as far as breaking this game down, I actually had a ton of notes on this one. I did a deep dive on it, but then Kawhi Leonard was ruled out, which makes like 80% of my notes irrelevant. A uh, couple things I want to mention, though. We need to point out that Golden State is on the first leg of a back-to-back. -back. They have this home game against the Clippers. They immediately fly out to Utah to play the Jazz tomorrow night. Not to mention it's the last night before the All-Star break. So a back-to-back -back with a travel right before the All-Star break. It's not the best spot for Golden State. I mean, who knows what to expect, honestly. And the other thing I want to show you is the three-point shooting numbers here. Obviously, we know the Warriors take a ton of above-the-break threes. That's no secret. But look at the Clippers' defensive numbers against the three-point shot in the last 10 games fourth and third in defensive efficiency against the corner and above the break three this is one of the best three-point defenses in basketball so as far as betting this game i won't touch the warriors here like i said i'm already in on the clippers unfortunately i have a terrible number i'm just gonna ride it out i mean no point in selling it at a, at a loss now i'm just gonna ride it out clippers minus one and a half i would still lean clippers without Kawhi Leonard it might be a pass for me though who knows if those numbers change those three-point defense numbers who knows if they go down without Kawhi? I don't want to bet Golden State at home where they've been worse against an elite three-point defense. I won't do it. So I'm leaning Clippers. I, I got screwed with the number. Whatever. If you want my top bets, parlays of the day, or you want to join our Discord, head over to kylekerms.com. The information's right there on the homepage. Let's have ourselves a good Wednesday night. Like I said, the live show, 3 p.m. college basketball, 4 p.m. NBA. Uh, for college basketball, Toast will be there, Scoop, Andy. For NBA, we got Prop Beaver and Ski. So we'd love to see you in the comments if you can make it. Let's have ourselves a good Wednesday night. Let's continue this, man. We've been really making some money here. Let's keep that rolling. Remember to bet responsibly, and I'll talk to you in the Discord.